defined off amp as a voltage control voltage source to the last gain and also discuss the number of circuits, mainly uh, the two basic amp circuits. And we also saw how to uh, how to operate them with both dual supplies and a single supply. Okay. So now we will discuss, uh, we will kind of uh, take a detour and discuss a uh, couple of other kinds of circuits which we are using in the lab and also uh, discuss another particular characteristic of the op amp. Uh, I have mentioned earlier that you have to have negative feedback around the op amp. Now you also need to have that negative feedback loop to be active for DC, okay. So that loop cannot be open for AC, we will uh, see why. This is the op amp and that is the input voltage Vg. This is the output voltage Vr with respect to some ground and I will assume that the op amp is operating with dual supplies. Okay. So in that case, if I plot V out versus V E, what do I see? Straight line with slope A naught. I will uh, show some steep slope, but as I mentioned earlier, this is really steep, and if you want to see uh, any finite slope at all, you have to use usually different uh, scaling for the x and y axis. Okay. We will assume that the saturation is at uh, VDD and minus VSS, although we know that in reality this will be a little bit below VDD and this will be a little bit above VSS, okay. So the output voltage cannot go all the way down to minus VSS, okay, it will be slightly above that and similarly it can't go all the way up to plus VDD, it will be slightly below that one, okay. Now uh, if you simply look at this, right, look at this characteristic. It looks like you can use the op amp by itself as a as an amplifier. That is, if I apply some uh, signal here, okay, I will get a naught times V X. Okay, as long as the output voltage doesn't reach the saturation level, that's what it looks like. Now it turns out this cannot be done at all, right? You cannot use the op amp uh, outside a DC negative feedback loop. Why might that be? Yeah, okay, let A not be very high. So maybe A naught is let's say 100,000 and I apply one microvolt signal. I should get 100 millivolt signal, right? That is okay. I mean, 100 millivolts will be within the saturation limits. Anyway, we have not discussed this. The point is, <coughs> this is still a somewhat oversimplified model of the op amp. I mean, we started with the extremely simple model saying it's just a gain and then we have added the supplies. There is also another very important detail which is that there is a small built-in voltage in the op amp. I mean, this is just a representation. It's not that there is a voltage source inside the op amp. What it is supposed to represent is the fact that the output of the op amp will not be A0 uh, times VE, but it will be A0 times VE minus VOS, okay. So you can think of uh, this part as the ideal op amp and the input to that ideal op amp is not the voltage that you apply, but that voltage shifted by a certain amount VOS and this VOS is known as the offset voltage, okay. So this characteristic I have drawn here, it is not really V0 versus VE, but it is V0 versus VE minus VOS, okay. 
So this is how it is going to be in reality. So what is the effect of this? So from this, I mean, I said uh, what I have drawn is the characteristic of what I have highlighted in green here. That is V0 versus VE minus VOS. Okay. This voltage is VE minus VOS. Now, of course, this VOS is not a physical voltage source. It is a result of some asymmetries in the circuit. That is, you. it turns out that uh, the transistors you use to make the op amp, they are not exactly identical to each other. Because of those mismatches, you get this effect. I mean, it is roughly like uh, you take any scale, right? I mean, any weighing scale that you have seen through three tops or anywhere. You don't put any weight on it, it doesn't necessarily show zero. Okay. Or similarly, if you take the old fashioned like hanging balance, it won't be perfectly horizontal if you don't put anything on it. There is a small offset. Okay. So if that offset is very small, you it doesn't matter. But in this case, it's exactly the same phenomenon. And the result, I mean the reason for that offset, like for instance, you have a, a balance and it's actually slightly tilted even if you don't put anything. The reason is actually there is some asymmetry. This side and that side are not exactly identical. Try to make them identical, but they are not exact. Similarly, you try to make the transistors identical and they won't be exactly identical. So, there is this from imbalance. Okay. Now, of course, this V minus VOS is not a measurable voltage. I mean, you can't really, uh, that's a representation, that's all. What you have accessible to you is these two terminals and that one. So, I want to plot V0 versus VE. What will it look like? I mean, I said this is V0 versus VE minus VOS, but this I use this plot because I am applying VE, I want V0 versus VE. What will that look like? Huh? What's that? Little below that, it's. I mean, whether it is uh, shifted to the right or left, uh, it depends on whether VOS is positive or negative. If VOS is positive, which way will it be? It will be right side. So basically, if VOS is positive, you have to apply a positive voltage to have zero at the internal op amp inputs, right? So the characteristic will be exactly the same, but shifted to the right. Okay, and the amount of shift is VOS. Now, this VOS itself is a random quantity. Okay, that is, are you familiar with uh, random variables? You are familiar with histograms? Yes. So, uh, let us say you take a thousand op amps and you measure this VOS somehow. Okay. What you will see is in some it will be positive, in some it will be negative. And in general, like many uh, things that you see in nature, it will have some distribution. If you plot the histogram, that is, let us say you take a thousand op amps, measure VOS, and what is the histogram? You plot a bar graph with the number of uh, op amps which have a particular VOS. So let us say VOS between 0 and 1 millivolts, 1 millivolts and 2 millivolts and so on. So, you get some bar graph like this, something like this. There will be a few samples which have probably very large values of VOS. So, in general, if you approximate this as a continuous thing, you will see a Gaussian. Actually, you know that I think lots of natural things that you see will have Gaussian distribution. So, it is actually a random quantity. Now, we do not have to worry about the distribution right now. Except that you can't say VOS is this particular value. Okay, so it will be different for every op amp that you uh, that you use. Okay, otherwise you could say, hey, I'll add something to VE, some fixed number to VE, and then get everything right. But you can't do that. Okay. So there is an offset, and it is random. And what does offset mean? Basically, a horizontal translation of the op amp characteristic. Okay. Yeah. Was there a question? Okay. 
So now what has this got to do with uh, what I just said? Earlier I said that you can't really use it like this, right? I can't apply a VI here and have this perform a useful function. However small VI is, let's say I apply VI of 1 microvolt and the gain of the op amp is 100,000. Then the output according to the linear model A0 times VI should be 100 millivolts, which is well within the saturation limit. So saturation is not the problem. So what is the problem here? VIS gets added. So where will the output be if I apply a small input? I mean, you look at the two characteristics I have, right? If I apply VI equal to 0, what is the output? With the offset? Really? I mean, you look at the shifted characteristic. Where is it? What is it? Minus VSS. So, it depends on exactly how much VOS is. But VOS itself will be a few millivolts or something. So, what happens is it will be saturated simply because of VOS. Okay. So, if you look at the blue characteristic here, even if I apply zero input, the red one is fine. The red one, if I apply zero, I am here. Okay. In the linear part of the characteristic. But if I have the blue op amp, I will be there. With zero input, my operating point will be already saturated. And if I apply an input over that, what will be the gain? How much will be the change? If I apply a small change in VI, how much will the output change by? Zero. It doesn't change at all. Okay. So, uh, we have not discussed it, but uh, there, is a, uh, there is a concept known as the incremental gain. That is, you are at some point and you change it by a little and you see how much the output changes. Okay. So, this is not output divided by input, but it is small change in the output divided by small change in the input. It is basically the slope of this curve, right? The slope of this curve is very large, A0, if you are between the saturation limits. But if you are at either saturation limits, the slope is 0. So, that means that the gain of this voltage controlled voltage source, the incremental gain is 0. Okay. It is completely useless. We want a large gain in the op-amp. So, we can't use it like this and it is completely unpredictable because uh, you could have another op-amp whose characteristic is like that, for which if you apply 0 input, it is saturated to plus VD. And this is exactly what will happen if you can go to the lab and you can try this. You apply supplies to the op-amp and tie both inputs to ground and measure the output. The output will not be 0. It is very likely to be saturated either positively or negatively. Okay. So, how do how to make all these things work or what happens in uh, when you do have negative feedback? So, let us take our usual uh, uh, non-inverting amplifier. Let us assume that this is operating with uh, dual supplies. Okay. Now, this op amp is not ideal. It has this offset VOS. Does this work correctly? So, what will be the output when VI equals 0? Why? Minus? Minus K times VOS, right? Actually, if you look at it, this is the ideal op amp that we had been assuming so far. Now, this VA is 0. This VOS is simply like applying an input to the circuit. Okay. And how much is the input? VOS. It is not 0, but it is still small. So, you will have minus K times because it is applied with that polarity. The output will be minus K times VOS. Is this clear to everyone that the output will be minus K times VOS? You see, VI and VOS are simply in series, but VOS has opposite polarity compared to VI, that is all. So, uh, if VI is 0, it is like having an input of uh, minus VOS. So, the output will be minus K times VOS. Okay. So, minus K times VOS, so this VOS, right, you can assume that to be typically, if we do not have any further information, of the order of a millivolt or so. Okay, maybe a couple of millivolts. So, if you have uh, moderate values of k like 10 or even 100, 
the value of k times v s will be 10 milli volts or 100 milli volts okay so which is still well within the saturation limits okay so if you do have negative feedback around the op amp it will be within the saturation limits regardless of the value of v s okay now if you do apply v i if v i is not zero what do you get yeah, you will get k times vi minus vos. So, the characteristics will be shifted. Instead of getting k times vi, you do get k times vi minus vos. But at least, you get a k times vi term. Right? Whereas, if the op amp is saturated, if you apply vi, the output does not change at all. Okay? That is not an amplifier. Here, what happens is, hey, I applied this uh, sine wave. I should have got... that sine wave and instead of that maybe I will get the same sine wave but shifted by k times v o s ok. So, there is an error but at least it looks benign all that has, all it has done is to shift the output down by k times v o s ok. And why, why does it work like this now I mean earlier here it did not work right. We, when we had VOS, it was just garbage. Now, why does it work here? Negative feedback. What does it do? Which input to zero? Yeah. So that's what I mean. It basically the negative feedback tries to make the difference between these two zero. So, that is what you want, right? That part has to be at 0. If it is at something other than 0, some substantial voltage, even 1 milli volt is substantial for an op amp, it will go to saturation. And we can actually plot the characteristics and see, ok. So, let us go back here. Let me copy over this. So, when, whenever you have a circuit like this, right, so this is VOS and this is VE and I will show this with 0 input, ok. So, let us say again uh, that what you know is the characteristic of the op amp that is the relationship between V O and V E ok. So, let us say you are given this circuit you know basic circuit analysis you have never heard of the op amp you are given the symbol and you are told that V O versus V E is like this ok. How will you find out what the output voltage is going to be? Could you do that? I mean, how do you analyze any circuit? What do you do? What do you do to analyze any circuit? Huh? Yeah, you essentially use Kirchhoff's current loss and Kirchhoff's voltage loss, right? So, and the connections, right? So, the circuit will have uh, components connected in a certain way. The connections will give you the Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law equations, how they are connected. And each component will have some characteristics, some current versus voltage or some input versus output, some characteristic. ok. Now, using these, you will have a number of variables and a number of equations resulting from the Kirchhoff's current law equations and Kirchhoff's voltage law equations and the element relationships, ok. So, from these, you solve for every voltage and current in the circuit. So, that is what you do, right. I mean, in this case, what is it that you do? So, for instance, I have this op amp. Our op amp is some black box. We do not know what it is except that it follows this characteristic. Okay. It is V0 versus VE. It has this piecewise uh, straight line characteristics. Okay. Now, what else do you have to do? What else is in the circuit? Huh? What do we have? I mean, 
this just tells you for the op amp if this is ve that is vo right you want to find out in this circuit what is the ve and vo going to be so you have to use the rest of the circuit isn't it so what how do you use that v equals v equals minus v of okay perfect so this part if you look at it all that is doing is I mean, you can also write Kirchhoff's current law here and so on, but this is a voltage divider, so you already know what it is, right? So this voltage here is going to be simply V O divided by K. So V E is minus V O divided by K because V E is defined with this positive and that negative. Okay. So the simultaneous, uh, you have now two constraints, right? And the solution is basically whatever satisfies both constraints you have a number of simultaneous equations and you solve that's all that's it and what is the what's one of the ways of solving like two simultaneous equations i have this characteristic which is given graphically and i have this equation uh, expression which uh, relates v to vo okay so how do i put the two together exactly i plot them on the same axis and find the intersection so i'll plot i want to plot this v equals minus v not by k on the same axis what should i do what 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 will the plot be straight line okay so remember here the y axis is v not x axis is v so you just have to rewrite this as v o s minus k times v e right and what will that uh, line look like Negative slope passing through the origin. What is the slope? Minus k. Okay. So let me draw a line like this. Okay. The slope of this is minus k. Also, we have done some analysis earlier. Uh, what is the slope of the op-amp characteristic? What is the in the middle region? What's the slope of the op amp characteristic? A naught. It's the gain of the op amp, and the slope of this line is minus k. Okay. Now, what is the relationship between these two? Which one will be more? Which one will be less? What did we want it to be? Like uh, A naught and k. Like what are the relative values of A naught and k? A naught by k has to be much more than one, right? In fact, when we evaluated the characteristics, the loop gain of this is A naught by k, and that has to be much more than one for you to get all the good things about negative feedback. In fact, if I draw it to scale, it's either that uh, the op amp's line will look vertical, or this will look almost horizontal, right? Typically, I mean, if you design a good circuit with a high enough loop gain, A naught by k, that's how it will look like. But I leave it like this. So, what do you infer from this? The point is, this k is, uh, I mean, this uh, the the other line is for sure not going to look like that, right? It will not have a comparable slope. Yes. So, what do you infer from this one? Fine, I have the two lines and I have the solution. So, if the op amp offset is uh, zero, then the point of intersection is here. If it is negative, it is there. If it is positive, it is there. So, what what is the point of all this? Clearly, it is not going to saturate, right? Because the point is, this line is quite shallow on this axis. Okay, so even if I move this around by a few millivolts to the left and right, the point of intersection may not be exactly in the middle of VDD and minus VSS, but it will be close to it, right? Because the point of intersection will never get close to the saturation levels, right? Because that is like several volts. And the slope of, uh, like I said, the slope of the op amp characteristic is much more than the slope of, I mean, this k. Okay, so this has this has negative feedback. In fact, one way of inferring that there is negative feedback is to is to notice that this line, the two intersecting lines have opposite slopes, right? The op-amp's line has a positive slope, the other one has a negative slope. 
Okay, so that's why you have uh, negative feedback. Okay, and with negative feedback, all these points of intersection will be close to where you want it to be. Where do you want it to be? You want it to be exactly in the middle of VDD and minus VSS. So that way, if a signal is, has to change, it has maximum room to swing on both sides, right? That's why if you have saturation levels, you want to be sitting in the middle so that you can have enough wiggle room on both sides. Okay, so this negative feedback will ensure that in presence of offset. This is extremely, extremely important and sometimes even in uh, some places you see circuits which don't have DC negative feedback. Those won't work at all. If you have op amp without DC negative feedback around them, it won't work because it is very likely that the op amp output will be sitting there or there. Okay. Any questions about this? So, negative feedback, first of all, we needed negative feedback to realize our function which is to realize an amplifier, okay. But not only that, simply to get the op amp working in the right region, you have to have DC negative feedback around it, okay. So that's why the new tutorial has like a whole bunch of problems with the op amp signs missing and you have to supply the sign. Okay. Any questions about this? built-in offset which is modeled, I mean it's not a voltage source in series but it is just modeled by voltage source in series with the input. You can put it in series with either input, it doesn't matter. And the polarity also doesn't matter because in a well-designed op-amp this will be random Gaussian you are familiar with the standard deviation, right? What is the standard deviation of uh, Gaussian? I mean, what does it tell you? We have a Gaussian distribution with a standard deviation of 1 millivolt. Let's say I tell you that the offset of the op-amp is random, it is Gaussian distributed and the standard deviation is 1 millivolt. What does it tell you? Hmm? How much? I mean, is it, I mean, does it mean that, yeah? Width of, I mean, the Gaussian, what is the expression for the Gaussian? Yeah, exponential minus x square by 2 sigma square. But uh, whatever it is, does it ever go to 0? No, right? So, how would you define the width? Half of the maximum? With x sigma, you get exponential minus half. It's actually not half of the maximum. No, but uh, you must have done this, right? Something about the number of trials and so on. If I measure a million op amps, which have uh, uh, standard deviation sigma of uh, 1 millivolt, what can you say? Yeah, actually, I mean, yeah, so usually you use like higher sigma numbers, so possibly you can say that if, uh, if 3 sigma is 99.9%, right? You have heard this term? Or so, in a Gaussian distribution, it will be like this and the sigma will be somewhere here, okay? This is the mean and mean we assume to be 0 for our offset and this is uh, minus sigma and this is plus sigma. So. I believe you, I don't, I have not verified this, but uh, this area he says this. What is the area under the whole thing? One, I mean, that is you have to multiply this by that, right? That's the probability distribution of a Gaussian. And the area under any probability density function is one, it has to be. That simply says that there is a likelihood of something happening, you don't know what it is. Then, if the area under the whole thing is one, the area under this is about 65% of that. And then, the area under, if you go to like plus minus 3 sigma, so that area will be about 99% of, 99.9% of the entire area of 1, okay. So what it means is, so let's say you have a 1000 op amps, okay, and you measure the offsets of all of them and you are told that the sigma is 1 millivolt. So that means that only one out of those thousand is likely to have a say, uh, likely to have an offset more than one millivolt. This is all likelihood. 
right? It's all statistical. Who knows? I mean, many more may have it. But when you have large and larger, larger and larger numbers, this becomes more and more true. Okay. So similarly, if you have uh, uh, like a million op amps that you test, right? And uh, sigma is one millivolt. Probably you expect that only about a thousand of them, thousand of one million will have offsets more than three millivolts. Either uh, more positive than three millivolts or more negative than minus three millivolts. Okay. I think plus minus three sigma corresponds to 99.9 percent. .9%. You can go and look it up. And you may have heard these terms like six sigma of quality and all these things. I mean, th that's what all this means, right? Six sigma means that uh, some overwhelmingly large fraction of uh, one is within the plus minus six sigma limits. This is essentially an indicator of uh, quality. That's all. Okay. So when you see the op amp data sheet, you should also look for this number. Uh, <coughs> you what you will be given is the sigma of the offset. Okay. Keep in mind that it's a random quantity, so that doesn't mean that means that you see a sigma of one millivolt. That doesn't mean the op amp has an offset of one millivolt. It means that if you measure a large number of op amps, you are probably not likely to see a op amp. I mean, op amps with offsets more than three millivolts very often. Okay. So for this reason, you need to have negative feedback. Around the op-amp, I mean, more importantly, DC negative feedback. The offset is DC, right? So the negative feedback loop around the op-amp. Sometimes there can be multiple loops through different op-amps and so on. At least one of those paths has to be active for DC. Otherwise, the op-amp itself will not be biased correctly. Biased meaning, uh, when you apply zero input signal, the op-amp's output should be close to zero. It may not be exactly zero, but it should be somewhere in the middle of VDC, VDD and minus VSL. If it is not that, you will saturate, right? So, for the op-amp to uh, work correctly, this is absolutely essential. Anytime you see an op-amp circuit, you should first make sure that it has DC negative feedback. Okay. No, the input can be anything. In fact, even without an input, this is happening. Right? The offset itself is a DC, right? And that's not something that you can remove from the op-amp. So even if I, that's why I was saying, like even if you apply zero input to an op amp, the output will be saturated because of the offset. Any questions on any of this? So now let's go to one of the circuits that you used in the lab. What did you make in the lab last week? Yeah, so basically it was an oscillator which used an integrator. Did it work? Okay. And what did this look like? How do you make an integrator? Capacitor or an inductor, right? Those are the two whose basic relationship has a derivative or an integral in them. Okay. And how did you make the integrator in the lab? What did the circuit look like? It used an op amp, right? I mean, this is for sure an integrator. It will integrate this current. But this is not what you used, right? What did you use? Huh? Positive? Positive feedback for the integrator. No, negative feedback. Okay, there are only two answers, or maybe it's also a no feedback option. But but what was the circuit? What did the circuit look like? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So 
okay and then as a resistor okay. this is what you had does this look like any other circuit we have actually dealt with in the course huh inverting amplifier okay What is the expression for the output of the inverting amplifier? Minus. Okay. So what is the expression here? Assuming it works in the same way, what is it? Exactly. So it's a. The only difference between these two is that. Here, both are uh, frequency independent components, and the gain is also independent of frequency. Whereas here, you have frequency dependent components. Well, it's very easy, right? At least, like in the Laplace domain, everything becomes algebraic. That's the reason we use the Laplace domain, right? I mean, if you uh, if you have capacitors and inductors, how do you describe the circuit? You need a differential equation, which are a pain to solve. But in the Laplace domain, the voltage-current relationship becomes proportional, right? So it becomes everything becomes like a resistor, except that okay, you have some terms containing S, but that's a that's a minor, very very minor detail. Okay, so that's why every circuit becomes as easy as only resistive circuits to handle. That's why we use Laplace transforms. And if we do use that, instead of uh, R2, we should have the impedance of this branch, which is one over S C, and you have R1, this is R, and of course you have the negative sign times D I. Okay. and if you invert the laplace transform what is the relationship that you get in the time domain what is it integration fine i mean what's the expression hmm minus 1 by cr integral via dt okay what is the dimension of 1 by cr What's the dimension of CR? Time, yeah, and it had better be there because you're integrating voltage with respect to time, so that has to go away to give you voltage output. Okay, so this behaves like an integrator, does it? What is the other difference between these two circuits? Okay, one is frequency dependent, one is uh, frequency independent. But uh, what else do you see? Other one doesn't have DC feedback. How does it work? I just lectured for half an hour on how DC feedback is absolutely crucial and so on. But how does this work? So let's see. I mean, let's try to use this circuit by itself and see what happens. This part, right, which is a current control voltage source, and we normally don't use current sources. We use a voltage source in series with the resistor to feed the input, and it's exactly the same here. This is also a current control voltage source, assuming the op-amp is a negative feedback, but with a uh, the the output voltage to input current ratio is frequency dependent. It is one by C. So in that sense, it's the same as this. You push a current into a capacitor here. You take V I and R, convert the input voltage to a current, and push it into the capacitor. So that's why it is giving you integration. Okay, but I mean there seems to be a problem. So of course we said that this is V I V naught. V naught is one over C R integral V I D T. Okay. So what is missing from this uh, model? I mean just now we discussed something right for the first half of this class. What was it? DC feedback. No. What? Real. Stop and offset. I think I had it like this. So it doesn't matter which polarity you put it in. The point is to know what it is. Okay. So if you include VOS, what is the output going to be? 
still let's pretend that the op amp is a negative feedback and it's a virtual short and so on okay when you have offsets what gets virtually shorted is the internal op amps inputs okay so what will be the output why did you write what's the expression for the output What is this voltage? Assuming what we are short. No, no, this just minus V O S. If you assume it's a virtual short, it is minus V O S. What is the current flowing through this? V I plus by R. So the same current will flow here, right? So what's the voltage across the capacitor? What is the voltage across the capacitor? One by C integral. I mean, I have indicated the polarity also. The current is going that way, so it is plus one by C integral V I plus V O S. Okay, so it integrates not just V I but also the offset voltage V O S. Okay, and the total output voltage. Is simply this voltage minus the capacitor voltage. Okay, so it is minus V O S minus one by C R integral V I plus V O S D T. Okay, this is the actual output and not that one. Okay, right? I mean, we just have we didn't have V O S. If you said V O S equal to zero, obviously we get the same expression. So we thought that was the output, but it is this. So is this a problem or not? Hmm. Okay. Obviously, because we have VOS in the circuit, the output also contains VOS in it. But is this a problem or is it uh, somehow manageable? Huh? Unbounded. Yeah. So actually, the VOS appears in two places. So this part is not a problem. I mean. Assuming V O S is small, it is simply shifting the output by a little bit. But this is a problem. However small V O S is, the effect of this is unbounded because it's integrated over time, right? And obviously, you said V I equal to zero. Even with V I equal to zero, the output will keep on. If V O S is positive, it will keep on ramping down. Okay. And what happens finally? It will go to saturation, either negative or positive, depending on the value of V O S. So even if you started off with a condition where uh, The op amp was in the correct region. Okay, the op amp has to be in the middle of the two saturation levels. Even if you started off there, this circuit will drive itself into the undesirable region of operation. Okay, so this circuit will never work. So how did it work last week? Last week the planetary alignment was good, and then. I mean, actually, this was not the only circuit, right? There is actually a, there is a, there is some other circuit. That is feeding back from here to there, so that is providing, in some way, a negative feedback. Otherwise, it won't work. What was the other circuit doing? Huh? Square wave. I mean, I can give a square wave with V I itself, but the important thing is it is sensing the output and giving this. It is feedback. It was not an inverting amplifier for sure. No, I mean, what was the relationship between? How the integrator output was changing, and what was coming back to the integrator input? Ah, uh, twenty to one, twenty to minus one, or maybe one because this itself has an inverting change. So basically, the point is, if this was going up like that, after it crosses a certain threshold, the input will switch so that it will start going down. So it won't let it go to saturation level, right? It was going to going towards saturation in every half cycle. It will either go towards positive or negative. But what would happen was this feedback here. It's actually not a linear circuit at all. The rest of the circuit, it's some non-linear circuit. But still, as it was going towards the saturation level, at some threshold, it would reverse the sign of the input. Okay, and then it will start coming down. Now, if you analyze it with offset, what will happen is the outputs will be changed a little bit. 
compared to uh, the ideal case without offset. But still, because you are actually looking at where the output is, if it crosses a certain threshold, you switch the sign of the input, it will still work. Basically, the rest of the circuit, the feedback around it is not letting it go towards saturate. That's what is happening. Okay. So, without something else providing feedback, this circuit cannot work. Okay. Any questions about this? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But was it a non-inverting amplifier or an inverting amplifier? What was the difference between that circuit and the inverting amplifier? The input was given from the output. Oh, that's not. Did the circuit look like this? But what was the difference? There is a very crucial difference. Right? The op amp, I mean, that's not a printing mistake, that's deliberate. Okay. So, we will see the reason for that, why we need to do uh, that. Okay. So, that's not a linear circuit at all. In fact, in that circuit, if you measure the difference between the input voltage of the op amp, it will not be 0. In fact, it will never be 0. It will be some large values. And it's not, it does not have negative feedback, it has positive feedback, and it is intended to be that way. Okay. So, we will discuss that circuit uh, maybe tomorrow. Now, we are out of time. But the point is the integrator by itself cannot work. Okay. So if at all you have to make this work, so this will work as long as the output remains within the saturation limits. But as we saw, because of the op amps offset, right, sooner or later it will drive itself out of the uh, correct region of operation. So, you have to have in one way or the other some feedback going from here to there or maybe from here to the op amps input. So, in one way or the other you need to have that. Okay. So, now I mean we will discuss the other circuit which is known as the Schmidt trigger in the next class. But tell me if there is a simple way of providing DC negative feedback from here to there. How could you do that? And you can compare it to the other circuit which actually works, right? I mean, we have seen some circuit which looks very much like this, but works in negative feedback. This one has negative feedback, this one doesn't. So, what can you add to this circuit to have provide negative feedback? Resistor, okay. So, <coughs> We can do this. Let me just call it RF. Okay. So now is there DC negative feedback around the op amp? There is actually. If you calculate it, you will find it. I mean, again, let me set VI to 0. Okay. How do you find out if there is DC negative feedback? What did we do earlier to find out the op amp signs and so on? You have to break the loop somewhere. Or another way to think about it is you can think of either breaking the loop here or at the input of the op amp and seeing what comes back. Or simply you can see you can apply V test here and the important thing is that DC if you are checking for DC negative feedback. So what is the voltage that appears here? At DC, what is it? Quickly, yeah, it's V test times some resistive divider ratio. So, this does have DC negative feedback, okay. But is this an integrator? We do not know. So, please evaluate the transport function V0 by VI of this circuit. This does have DC negative feedback. So, you can assume what will talk and so on. And you can also see if you do have an offset VOS. The output will not become unbounded here. Okay. But this is not quite an integrator. This can work approximately like an integrator in certain circumstances. You can figure out what that is. Okay.